Welcome to Library Seminars, NOAA Central Library's virtual stage for the presentation of research and ideas that reflect the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's mission. This webinar is part of the Knaus Lunch and Learn series, where each month the 2022 Knaus Fellows have an opportunity to showcase their own research or the projects they're supporting during the fellowship. Today, the fellows will be discussing what is the Knaus Force. Mariana Rocha de Souza, the Knaus Fellow at NOAA's Global Ocean Monitoring and Observing Program, will be our host and will introduce our speakers. Before I turn this webinar over to the fellows, just a few reminders. We highly encourage you to ask questions, which the speakers will address at the end of their presentation. So please type them in the chat box throughout the seminar as they come to you. You'll find the questions chat box in the control panel. All audience members are muted and are off camera. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel later today. I will put the link to the channel in the chat box so that you can share it with others who may be interested in today's topic. With that, the mic is yours, Mariana. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, so I'm Mariana. I'm also a Canals Fellow placed at Gobo. And, and at the beginning of the Canals Fellowship, the fellows get together and create committees as a way to learn more and work together on a particular topic. Today's Lunch and Learn will focus on one of those committees. We're going to hear a series of short talks from a few Canals Fellows talking about the force, the Fellows for Organized Resilient Coastal Efforts Committee. Uh, so Rebecca and Eleanor, take it away. Thank you. Uh, we are excited to be here today and to share some of our work as Canals Fellows in the coastal resilience space specifically. This is a topic that we are all very passionate about and we each bring unique perspectives to the table. We've grown a lot individually and also as a cohort over the past 10 months and this Lunch and Learn has been a really fun way to kind of reflect on that growth. And it probably goes without saying um, that this discussion is inherently shaped by our own experiences and our knowledge and we want to acknowledge that the views shared here are our own um, and do not represent an official stance of our host office or agencies. Uh, next slide, Eleanor. Um, so with almost half of the US population living along the coast, it is important, uh, crucial that we support and understand and support the cultural, social, economic, and ecological functions that our coastal communities and ecosystems serve. Um, as it says here, the U.S. coastal states, territories, communities, economies, and ecosystems are facing a growing array of event-based and long-term coastal hazards, and this includes impacts of changing water levels, land subsidence, sea level rise, marine debris, oil and chemical spills, harmful algal blooms, ocean acidification, marine heat waves, the list goes on, um, but this is just to name a few. And one of the other uh, tools that I actually had the opportunity to use during my dissertation and then was excited to be engaging with while I was at NOAA as well, is the Billion Dollar Disasters tool, which if you haven't seen it, um, highly recommend looking at it and sending it off to family and friends to discuss. Uh, we've gone from 82 days of billion uh, between billion dollar disasters in the 1980s to approximately 18 days between disasters now. And NOAA maintains a comprehensive suite of coastal and ocean observing infrastructure to help understand these disasters that we're seeing more frequently including environmental satellites, a network of ocean buoys, and more than 200 permanent water level stations along the U.S. coasts and Great Lakes. And NOAA's network of flood forecast tools and capabilities help warn U.S. communities of impending flood dangers, including coastal flooding due to tropical storm surge and sunny day high tide floods, which are growing more common due to sea level rise along the U.S. coast. And as someone who conducted their research in Charleston, South Carolina, I can say firsthand that it impacts daily life constantly. People are very um, aware of the flooding situations and in fact, sometimes leave work early or stay late when there's going to be a high tide and raining at the same time. So 
transitioning from the coastal mission space to the coastal resilience mission space. Um, this is a general definition of resilience, the capability of all communities to anticipate, prepare for, respond to, and recover from significant multi-hazard threats with minimum damage to the social well-being, the economy, and the environment. Um, today, we're largely focusing specifically on coastal resilience to climate and extreme weather-related hazards. And resilient coastal populations, ecosystems, and economies have the capability and capacity to sustainably adapt and prepare for long-term chronic change, in addition to withstanding and recovering from event-based disruptions. And for this to be successful, for us to achieve coastal resilience, decision makers and citizens must both understand coastal hazards and climate change at varying timescales and magnitudes, in addition to having the capacity and capability to take action to reduce their risk of deterioration or loss um, to these natural hazards um, and change over time. And this graphic is one way that we can think about resilience. So there are many different graphics out there and many different theories to discuss. And this particular one, starts with that cyclical nature of recovery where there's pre-event functioning and then the event occurs there's a time period of dysfunction and then recovery and around that circle we have observed communities um, going for a long period of time however with this shortening of time between disasters as well as compound impacts like COVID-19 uh, what we're instead starting to think about is how do we improve resilience over time and that's that adaptation that Rebecca talked about, where at that recovery phase, uh, communities then hopefully adapt and learn from their experiences, and over time, the resilience of the community increases. And so there are different kind of hierarchies or ways that uh, I've my brain has started to think about the coastal resilience mission space, um, the kind of large circle being federal or interagency uh, efforts in coastal resilience. And so the figure on the right um, is illustrative of kind of the spectrum of activities that are needed to support and form decision making for achieving coastal resilience. And not only do we need the data and the observations, um, but we also need to support research to develop and expand upon our modeling and predictive capabilities, and then to translate this information into decision support tools and to coordinate across agencies um, and you know, with uh, cross-sector partners to figure out exactly how to optimize uh, this process. And this final step should also be grounded in an equitable, collaborative, and iterative service delivery uh, framework. And so serving across this value chain of science to services for coastal resilience are numerous cross-sector entities uh, and both within and across agency groups. And as Canals Fellows, uh, we're gonna be focusing on legislative and executive activities in coastal resilience, starting at the highest level on the executive side. Uh, some of us interact with the executive office of the president and several interagency bodies. Um, one of which uh, I've been involved with is the Coastal Resilience Interagency Working Group, and that's co-led by NOAA and CEQ. Um, and the uh, it was one of the first interagency working groups or IWGs established under uh, the executive order tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. And its goal is to enable a whole of government approach to addressing the climate crisis. And currently there are 12 agencies participating in this working group. And its focus areas are on aligning major federal involvement in coastal resilience activities, promoting access to effective and equitable funding opportunities, and facilitating the use of federal data sharing and mapping resources to improve investment decision making. Um, and it also currently now houses the Community Driven Relocation Subcommittee, which has met a couple of times uh, and is getting off the ground. And it's engaged uh, with the report on nature-based solutions working group as well. Um, and then there's also the uh, White House Flood Resilience IWG that another Canals Fellow is uh, very involved with and will speak to um, in a little bit. Um, and in addition to the Coast Resilience IWG and the Flood IWG, um, there's also the Interagency Council for Advancing Meteorological Services, ICAMS, um, and USGCRP, the Global Change Research Program, um, 
and there are many more, but these are just a couple that uh, I've personally interacted with um, and it's been a continual learning curve. It certainly has been. And another example of interagency collaboration is the more one-on-one -on -one collaborations that um, I've had the opportunity to work on as well as um, supporting some of Rebecca's work and the task, task forces and IWGs that she just touched on. And that one example of that is through the NOAA Department of Transportation Work Plan and Collaboration. We've been working together uh, for years, but what I've been able to support is this last year's um, effort where it's developing a work plan. And for many years before that, we worked on a variety of weather and climate activities because our transportation systems are both vulnerable to climate change and also offer an opportunity for innovative thinking on a long on long term climate resilience. And those include the coastal roads that many of us drive on if you're on any of the coasts or along the Great Lakes. And I had the opportunity to support this incredible progress and watch the process happen that's been made by Tina Hodges, who is the NOAA liaison to DOT, as well, as, well as Heather Halsinger at DOT, and the working group of NOAA and DOT experts that supported the work plan and are now supporting the many efforts that we have within that, including one that's specifically focused on coastal resilience, um, which is I think we're going to hear about a little bit in um, some of the slides coming up, but that's the effect of sea level rise grant program um, and some story maps and coastal resilience along the California coast uh, transportation systems. And then zooming in a little bit more, we can think about cross NOAA coastal resilience mission space. And so as with the previous slide, this is not an exhaustive list of coastal resilience activities within or outside of NOAA, but it is more a reflection of our own experiences as fellows um, and who we are interacting with and what we're engaging with. And so in general, if I did the math right, there are 35 Canal executive fellows spread across five NOAA line offices. Meanwhile, there are still 15 other executive fellows that are spread out across 12 other federal agencies. And then in addition to that, we have 18 legislative fellows. And so um, we all have you know, unique perspectives. We're spread out across different agencies, uh, but for the most part, a majority of us uh, are interacting a lot in the NOAA space. Um, and so two of the bodies within NOAA that I wanted to call out um, just based on my own experience are the Weather Water Climate Board and the Ocean and Coastal Council. And so I won't speak in depth to their role, but I have appreciated the opportunity to engage with them. The Ocean and Coastal Council oversees NOAA's participation in the Ocean Decade, which spans uh, line office efforts. Um, and within the Weather Water Climate Board, there is the Ocean and Coast Team, Climate Team, Water Team, and Modeling Team. So a ton of effort underway and a lot of really passionate and engaged folks. And then within NOS, specifically the National Ocean Service, um, I am personally situated in the front office, I'm working with Mark Osler, who is the Senior Advisor for Coastal Inundation and Resilience. And as a line office, NOS supports risk-informed decision-making. It provides equitable access to actionable authoritative data, products, and services relevant to coastal conditions to help communities plan for both the near and long-term resilience of our nation's coasts. And in addition to this preparedness and risk reduction aspect, NOS activities also include ecological forecasting and coastal ecosystem conservation and restoration. And so within NOS, one of the fellows that will be speaking here today um, is Elizabeth, and she is placed within the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science and Costs um, in that program office. And I'm excited to hear her elaborate on her experiences there in a moment. And then some of the other examples of cross NOAA collaboration I'll talk about. Uh, first is the Senior Advisor for Climate. So if anyone watching has had the opportunity to engage with some of the Climate Ready Nation, um, messages or events that have come out, it's really been a very exciting uh, vision to be working on as a fellow. We just had the Climate Ready Nation Town Hall a few weeks ago, and then the Environmental Data Management Workshop also had a focus on, uh, on Climate Ready Nation, uh, where we worked through that DOT NOAA work plan and visioned what it really meant to be a resilient country 
by 2030? And what data and services can NOAA provide to help make that happen? And one thing that I've learned through this fellowship is that building a climate ready nation will truly take all of us at NOAA uh, to do our part, help and help build resilience to the major climate risks we face. And as we've already talked about a little bit, floods, droughts, wildfires, extreme heat and coastal vulnerability are all hazards that so many of you work on across the organization. And as fellows, we get to learn about them from all of you. And as I just said, coasts are one of the risk areas of climate ready nation. And I had the opportunity to engage on some recent climate ready coasts, bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, notices of funding announcements, as well as um, other discussions. And from that, I learned about how coastal communities will continue to face significant impacts due to sea level rise, such as flooding, erosion, and ecosystem loss, which I have seen firsthand through my research and my recent visit that I was able to participate in to Alaska and specifically Utkiagvik, which is as far north as you can go up on the point, where there there's actually human-made dunes that have been erected to protect the coastal roads in the community. And even then, as I was speaking with community members, they described how those roads continue to be flooded um, due to uh, erosion and, and um, other aspects of coastal vulnerability. So all of that leads to um, exciting opportunities within Climate Ready Nation and Climate Ready Coast that I'm sure we have not seen the last of and will continue to uh, be across NOAA and cross line office engagement and including in the Weather Water Climate Board that Rebecca just talked about. And then also as a fellow, I sit within the Climate Program Office in OAR. And that's given me the opportunity to see the climate team as well as other cross line office and inter intra line office collaboration specifically on climate change. And on the policy side of things, executive orders and legislation both influence and interact with agency priorities, capacities, and mission space. So, for example, NOAA mandates and authorizations span. Um, a wide field uh, ranging from coastal and ocean observations, mapping and navigation, in addition to marine sanctuaries, fisheries management, ocean acidification, marine debris, harmful algal blooms, and decision support tools. And so, again, this is not an exhaustive list of uh, policy and legislation, and you will get to hear from one of our legislative fellows and our policy and constituent affairs fellows um, who know a lot more about this than uh, I do personally, but some of the uh, important legislation that has popped up during my time here as a fellow is HR 3228, the National Coastal Resilience Data and Services Act, which would authorize NOAA to advance an integrated suite of coastal data, information, and services to better inform national coastal risk. There's also an amendment to the Coastal Zone Management Act, um, HR 1415, which is the Tribal Coastal Resiliency Act, and it authorizes the Department of Commerce to award competitive grants to Indian tribes to further achievement of tribal coastal zone objectives. And then there is the Digital Coast Act, um, and this is a platform that integrates geospatial data, decision support tools, training, and best practices to address coastal management issues and needs. And this is helping us enhance resilient communities, ecosystem values, and coastal economic growth and development by uh, helping coastal communities um, through both cost-effective and participatory solutions. And then finally, the Executive Order 14008, Tackling the Climate Crisis. Um, this is one of the orders that authorized the creation of the Coastal Resilience Interagency Working Group, for example, and that um, those interagency working group bodies. And so the text of that is essentially um, allowing the U.S. to move quickly to build resilience, both at home and abroad, against the impacts of climate change that are already uh, manifesting and will continue to intensify according to current trajectories. And as Rebecca said, there are a lot of fellows that aren't, weren't able to make it today, but are working on all aspects of, of these policies and legislation, as well as um, many that aren't listed here and that are impacting coastal resilience and climate resilience at NOAA and with other agencies. Um, so just a little bit of background before we jump into what we've been teasing this whole time. 
which is discussing with other fellows. So FORCE is an informal working group among CANALS fellows engaged in coastal resilience efforts to actively exchange legislative and executive knowledge activities and priorities related to coastal resilience, also identify opportunities for any enhanced coordination among federal agencies, because as Rebecca said, there we're not just at NOAA, and reduce the knowledge gap in coastal resilience related issues and topics within the larger CANAS cohort. So you definitely don't need a pre pre-existing knowledge of coastal resilience to be part of FORCE, which is part of the exciting um, aspect of the committee is that we're sharing knowledge and growing and learning as policy members and scientists through the whole year. Uh, the FORCE membership currently consists of 27 fellows. They're, we're skewed towards NOAA as I think the Canals Fellowship generally is, but there, we also have, we have 14 fellows across four line offices at NOAA. We also have five fellows represented representing other agencies, including FEMA and the Coastal States Organization, BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, USGS, EPA, and NSF, as well as six legislative fellows on our membership. And some of our past projects include working with the Subcommittee on Ocean Science and Technology on their workshop, as well as with the National Museum of Natural History, doing a volunteer panel, and doing a DEIJ panel in previous years. And some of our current projects, we're having coffee chats. We have one coming up with the National Hazards Workshop Director, Lori Peake, on Friday. We also are conducting expert is, is in sessions at the National Museum of Natural History and hope to have future cohorts of fellows also engage with the Air and Space Museum. And we're conducting cross NOAA coastal resilience interviews. So if you're watching this and you're interested in being interviewed about your views on coastal resilience, certainly reach out. And with that, we are going to switch over to the lightning talks. And we're gonna go in order from left to right. So if everyone could turn on your cameras, we're um, going to get started and we'll just introduce ourselves as we go through this list. I believe I'm the first one. So um, I'm Eleanor Perel. I'm the Climate Policy Fellow supporting the Senior Advisor for Climate at NOAA, uh, so Co Barrett, um, pictured here in Utkavik in Alaska, um, which was an amazing experience. And my background actually was first in coastal agriculture, so studying how sea level rise was impacting coastal producers, um, how it was decreasing their productivity, as well as being impacted by consistent flooding and marsh migration. And that led me to, that was all using satellite remote sensing, um, using NOAA data and NASA data. And that led me to be interested in how um, communities more generally were being impacted and small business owners. And for my PhD, I then switched to focus more on that broader community view of resilience, where I was working with coastal small businesses and communities on how they were responding to and adapting to coastal resilient or coastal um, events and disasters such as hurricanes and sunny day flooding and then ultimately also adding in that compound disaster uh, impact, impact that we were not able to avoid anywhere in the world which was COVID-19 and thinking about how decisions of coastal communities and the participants in those communities can impact whether they're more or less resilient when an event occurs. And all of this led me to think about that long-term resilience aspect, so not just a single event, but the compound events, and work on Climate Ready Nation, as I've already discussed. And that really gave me the opportunity to think about what it meant to be a resilient country, also uh, how to support resilience at an international level, because part of my fellowship is also supporting the Inter Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change at the UN and thinking about what it means as fellows to be climate ready, both as scientists, as um, participants in the federal government, wherever we end up after this fellowship, it really does mean that we become ambassadors for coastal resilience as members of FORCE. And it's been an exciting journey. I'm looking forward to the rest of it and continuing to engage with um, all of the different FORCE members and people at NOAA. 
Thank you, Eleanor. And I am Rebecca Atkins. I am a fellow working with Mark Osler. Uh, I think I mentioned the Senior Advisor for Coastal Inundation and Resilience, who sits at the um, front office of the National Ocean Service. And working with Mark over the past 10 months has been a really great opportunity to learn about the breadth of coastal resilience activities that span this value chain that I mentioned of data to services. Um, and something that I've learned is that it's crucial to understand the priorities and the needs of the folks who are working to progress our capabilities along each piece of this chain. But it's also imperative to think strategically about how to then align these pieces and to forge collaborations with cross-sector and inter- and intra-agency partners. And so amidst the frenzy of these many moving parts, um, it has been inspiring to interact with folks who at the end of the day just want to help people. And so interwoven across every aspect of the National Ocean Service is this understood need for equitable service delivery, diverse partnerships, and more accessible and geographically comprehensive data and observations. And it has been um, humbling and um, really inspiring to be a part of that. Um, and within uh, two weeks of beginning as a fellow, just as an example of this, I was thrown into the fray of the release of an updated sea level rise report, um, the sea level rise technical report. And so um, this is something that happens or should, will probably be going forward happening around every five years. It was last updated in 2017. And so this was the 2022 update to that report. Um, and then shortly after that, there was a rollout of a companion application guide to then translate these updates to on the ground application. And so the technical report itself was an amazing opportunity to see how information was shared during a congressional briefing and further developed by NOAA's communication teams for a broader audience. It received a ton of uh, media attention, which was just amazing to watch unfold. Um, and this was also my first look at interagency collaboration. So this technical report was the result of an interagency um, effort with contributions to the report from NOAA, NASA, USGS, EPA, FEMA, Army Corps, and others. And uh, what was wonderful and amazing was that the effort didn't stop there. So following over a year of collaboration among the technical report authors, on the ground decision makers, and regional partners, there was a first of its kind application guide uh, that I just mentioned that was designed to make this information accessible and applicable to local communities. And over the last 10 months, I've helped to coordinate continued engagement with this report and application guide. And I'm now working to facilitate a NOAA funded symposium at the National Adaptation Forum in Baltimore next month. And I'm really excited to see folks in person gathered to share their experience with creating these resources. Um, I've also had an opportunity to engage with the interagency space, attending the Coastal Resilience IWG meetings and disseminating summaries from those meetings across NOAA, and then interacting with FEMA, USGS, NASA, NSF, and other private sector partners as we work to align our coastal resilience priorities and expertise. And then globally, um, the picture that you see in the top left is an experience that I am particularly excited about. It was with the United Nations Global Platform on Disaster Risk Reduction. I traveled with Mark, who was a, a US uh, delegate to Bali, Indonesia, for this global platform uh, convening. And I learned about global efforts to minimize our risk to natural disasters and climate change. Um, incredibly eye opening. And I am still uh, staying involved with the US reporting side of things on disaster losses, particularly related to blue and green infrastructure, which is kind of a, an, um, a new effort that we are trying to push for starting this year. And this is in collaboration with colleagues at USGS. And then lastly, uh, I'm amidst all of this, still working on writing my dissertation. Um, and in November, hopefully I will defend uh, my work on salt marsh ecology, which feels like a far cry from where I am now. Um, but looking back, my research was still very much connected to coastal ecosystems working in salt marshes from Florida to Delaware. Um, and as a researcher, I also interacted really frequently with six of NOAA's National Estuarine Research Reserves, um, which was incredible and is one of the reasons why I was so inspired to apply to become a Canals Fellow. Um, and so I'd like to think that my perspective as a salt marsh ecologist, ecophysiologist working on snails, uh, has afforded me a unique perspective coming into my fellowship and focusing on more applied coastal resilience initiatives, um, and also coming from Florida. I'm well aware of the importance of our coastal communities.
Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I my name is Elizabeth McNamee. Um, my position is in the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, or NCOS. This is in the National Ocean Service in NOAA. Um, and specifically, I'm within the Competitive Research Program. Um, and so I have not quite a traditional Canouse Fellow background. Uh, I am a geographer at heart and then um, got a master's in soil science. Uh, and I'm currently working on my PhD in agronomy, um, where I'm studying uh, water use and irrigation strategies that farmers can use to conserve water, specifically in potatoes, as you see pictured here in my glamour shot. Um, but that's all to say that I am finding a lot of links between uh, agriculture and the applied nature of the research I was doing and the approach that uh, my office is taking for supporting that applied work. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, but the competitive research program that I'm working with, uh, the director for that is Dave Kidwell, and he's my mentor. Um, and CRP supports the development of actionable information and tools that improve how our nation can protect, manage, and conserve ocean and coastal ecosystems. So this ends up being funding regional scale and targeted research through a competitive peer-reviewed process that is all external to NOAA. We do fund some internal things, but um, it's just when they're internal partners. Uh, and so this can be everything from harmful algal blooms to hypoxia to coastal resilience and sea level rise. Uh, so I'm specifically within the Effects of Sea Level Rise program, or EASLER, um, and I'm going to talk about that more in a moment. Um, but some of the other things that I've been working on just more generally is um, forming congressional outreach and engagement uh, by hosting some uh, briefings where we uh, bring in, I've you know brought in scientists that we've funded with these programs, um, and they've been able to share their results to uh, staffers. Uh, from Congress. Um, I'm also working on a coastal change program review, which is kind of um, hurting all of the uh, research and scientists and work that's been happening over the last five years uh, within NCOS related to coastal change and creating all the information for that um, as it gets reviewed by an external review panel to see what improvements can be made. Uh, and then lastly, uh, there's a relatively new cooperative institute um, called Cairo for short, uh, that is out of the University of Alabama. And one of their projects um, is being sort of facilitated by our office in terms of the funds. And so I've been um, facilitating that relationship and uh, organizing those meetings. And the um, project focus there is going to be more on nature-based solutions uh, and evaluating um, the effect of uh, nature-based solutions as a way to mitigate the effects of sea level rise. Next slide, please, Eleanor. So the Easler program, which is the um, supporting uh, the program manager here, Trevor Meckley, um, is probably the, uh, takes up the majority of my time. Uh, in this program, uh, funds science that explores natural solutions and policy changes to protect ecosystems, infrastructure, and communities against flooding from sea level rise and storm surge. So within Easler, we fund these projects that, um, more recently, projects that will evaluate the potential for nature-based solutions and policy actions to reduce flooding impacts to ecosystems, uh, humans, and infrastructure. Uh, in 2021, there were 14 active projects with a total budget of 14.6 million. Uh, that has gone up in 2022 to be 17 active projects. Um, and this program leverages the NOAA expertise around coastal resilience and then uses an extensive regional partner uh, network, like agencies from, including agencies from the Army Corps. Uh, FEMA, the Nature Conservancy, state programs, parks and reserves, and others, and bringing together these teams of interdisciplinary scientists from ecologists, biologists, economists, engineers, social scientists, and most recently, as Eleanor alluded to, um, transportation professionals and engineers. Um, and so at the proposal stage, uh, it's a requirement that the teams um, have to have already identified end users 
and um, of the work that they're going to produce to ensure that the science that they're creating um, and evaluating can be applied to decision making. So this creates an end-to-end -end science to management framework. And so since we can't, although we can't fund the eventual management projects, um, we can help empower uh, managers to do so and to do that based on sound science. Uh, and so what I found really unique and fascinating about this position in this program is that it is intersecting with science in a way that I never have before in that it is, um, you know, these program managers are able to work within NOAA and within their networks to identify a science gap and then do something about it to issue uh, a funding opportunity where that science gap can be filled. Uh, and I think that's really powerful. Um, and so this is an example here of the California coast and one of the projects um, that is starting to come to fruition for, uh, you know, in considering questions that managers might look at um, on a day-to-day -day basis of, okay, what if we moved this road back or what if we nourish this beach with more sediment? What are the approaches uh, that we can use to um, mitigate the effects of sea level rise in our region? And what are the specific actions we can take and what are the costs and benefits of those? Um, I found that, um, you know, this is, like Rebecca said with her work, you know, a far cry from my agriculture background, um, but I'm really enjoying the applied side of this work. So I've gone from doing science to answer questions that farmers have um, and to provide them with solutions to helping fund science to answer questions that coastal managers and people on the ground have. So at the end of the day, it's all about helping people, like I think Rebecca said earlier. Uh, now on to you, Caitlin. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, like Elizabeth, I come to the canals from a slightly less traditional uh, background. I do not come from a master's or a PhD program. I actually come from law school. I went to Vermont Law School, which is known for their environmental law program. And so I focused on water law and marine um, and coastal law and policy. And so that actually kind of worked out into my favor because I am like Elizabeth and Rebecca I'm in the Ocean Service. I am in their Policy and Constituent Affairs Division, and my main portfolio is focusing on our interagency ocean policy efforts. Um, and I also do some offshore wind work as well. Um, and the work I do, it is larger than just the coastal resilience space, but there are a lot of touch points to coastal resilience, and um, everything I do kind of does relay back to coastal resilience. So um, for instance, I helped to staff um, the Ocean Resources Management Subcommittee of the Ocean Policy Committee, which is a high level interagency body that guides our national ocean policy. Um, it is chaired by the heads of both CEQ and OSTP. Um, and so this work touches upon policy that will help coastal communities sustainably manage our ocean resources, um, ensuring equitable co-use of our of all those ocean and coastal resources. Um, so a couple of things that we're doing um, in the ocean policy space is um, last year at COP26, um, John Kerry, Secretary Kennedy announced that the United States had joined the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. You can see the, um, the logo right there. So that is an international commitment to sustainably manage um, our oceans. Um, it addresses themes of ocean health, wealth, knowledge, equity, and finance. Um, so the Ocean Resources Management Subcommittee has been tasked with creating um, you know, the national plan for America um, to sustainably manage 100% of our oceans. So we are currently working towards engaging with uh, local, state, territories, tribal governments, regional organizations, industry, um, environmental constituencies, interested stakeholders, and the general public to understand which values they prioritize for resilient coastal communities and sustainable ocean management. Um, so this plan, we are tasked to creating it by 2027. So we are just in the beginning stages. Um, hopefully it will result in something that will 
be able to um, it'll, it'll, we'll have sustainable ocean planning in place by 2027. Um, we have also been tasked with developing an ocean climate action plan which will help guide and coordinate actions both by the federal government and um, the larger community of ocean users to address ocean, coastal, and Great Lakes-based mitigation and adaptation solutions um, to the impacts of climate change. So this action plan will summarize planned federal ocean-based climate actions and the benefits of them, as well as identifying gaps in knowledge and application um, to emerging ocean climate issues. So as Elizabeth was talking about um, identifying gaps and hopefully figuring out ways to fill those gaps in knowledge. Um, and so I do that work, which is high level directing and shaping our ocean and coastal policy, but I also help to implement policy through more interagency work. As Rebecca mentioned earlier, I also help to support the Flood Resilience Interagency Working Group which is a body responsible for implementing the federal flood risk management standards, which are um, executive order direction, executive order 13960. So the, these standards, FFRMS, um, are put in place to ensure that agencies take actions to enhance our nation's resilience to current and future flooding risk and to better prepare the United States for the impacts of climate change such as sea level rise and extreme weather events. So the executive order is directing federal products and federal money, making sure they're not used in flood hazard areas or practicable, and to use nature-based solutions to mitigate unavoidable flood risks. So thanks to that sea level rise report that Rebecca had worked on, um, we have actionable science in the coastal realm to do what we are calling a climate informed science approach to flood risk mapping and currently this interagency working group is working on finishing up a state of the science report for this climate informed flood science and we are in the beginning stages of developing a decision support tool which will help inform siting decisions and then i also do some offshore wind work so i work with offshore wind experts from across NOAA to help ensure that offshore wind development is done in a sustainable, safe, and informed manner, and is also done in a way that minimizes any potential negative impacts to coastal communities, such as fishing communities, because there's a lot of concerns about the impacts of offshore wind and fisheries. Um, and we're also trying to maximize the benefits for those communities, ensuring that there are some good paying jobs um, and there's no potential other conflicts. Um, and so uh, the National Ocean Service in particular, we have been providing some data and tools to um, groups like the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which is in charge of offshore wind development. Um, we are helping them um, inform siting decisions through marine spatial planning. Um, so that's choosing the best places to put those wind turbines. Um, we are helping to evaluate potential impacts and we are also maintaining accurate ocean data in offshore wind energy areas. So that is kind of a broad look at my portfolio and I can now hang it off the screen. Thank you, Caitlin. Now, like Caitlin, I come from a law background. I have a JD and LLM environmental law. So I am here in the House of Representatives and for the federal side of things, we look at all the great things that agencies and departments are doing with all these amazing projects you've heard throughout our presentation today. But for us, we look at how do we fund these things? How do we get these things off the ground? How do we make sure that people are actually getting the product that they need to be able to fight resiliency and mitigation and be able to live in these communities for the future? So here in the House and the Senate, legislative side, we have the power of the purse given to us by Constitution which means we're in charge of figuring out how do we use these taxpayer dollars. And through that, there's two processes that usually we look at, that's authorization appropriations. Now authorization is the permission to spend an amount of money, but that's not the spending authority for that money. That's where appropriations come in. So you have this ceiling through authorization, like you can spend up to so many millions of dollars. 
the appropriations tell you just how much of that is for your program or your for a department or for your agency. So for us, we look at how much money can we give NOAA? How much money can we give data science? How much money can we give satellite programming? And parse that out. And all, it actually goes all the way down to community levels through earmarks. So community-based driven projects inside our constituencies, we're able to write earmarks for those and look at the funding for that. So we follow the money here in the House and the Senate. And that's just through those two processes. We also have legislation that gives dedicated funding streams for a certain levels of fiscal years. Uh, next slide, please. And one of the acts that we actually have to look at as far as coastal resiliency is GOMESA, which is the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act from 2006. This is actually really important for our Gulf Coast communities because for our master plans, I'm from Louisiana, so I'm intimately familiar with GOMESA. It, this is how we fund resiliency, mitigation, hurricane protection as a lot through GOMESA money. Now, this money comes through revenue sharing for offshore oil and gas. And it's only for certain authorized uses. Now, the states here, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, only get 37.5 percentage of those leases from offshore oil and gas. The rest goes either to our national budget or to funding through land and water conservation. But as you can see on our slide, we have certain authorized uses. You can see these are the master plans for our different states. Next slide, please. However, we can't just depend on oil and gas for our energy future. All of us here know that we look at different uh, diversification of clean energy, hydro, solar, and as Caitlin was mentioning, wind. <laughs> now, offshore wind is a really hot topic right now, both on the executive and legislative side. For our administration, we actually have a goal of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. Now, as Caitlin mentioned, BOEM is the agency looking at these lease sales and making sure they're in areas where that will have huge impacts and be sustainable into the future. And we're looking at the possibility of seven offshore wind auctions by 2025. So we're really ramping up our lease sales through BOEM. One big one actually happened in the New York fight in February. It was six bidders and it was like a historical bid sale of $4.4 billion through these six leases. The image you have here are actually different lease sales we have going on in our Eastern Atlantic. And our office here, the Office of Congressman Meliotakis, is New York. So we're Staten Island and South Brooklyn. We are very familiar with what's going on in our Atlantic with these lease sales. We're actually part of the process and part of Formation Wise, figuring out what's going on as far as our terminals and what's going to be building these, these wind farms into the future. So we are very concerned about what's happening and how can we possibly bring money back to the states from these offshore wind sales. So we looked at GOMESA because it is a historical revenue sharing stream that we have for energy. And we thought, can we do something about this for wind? And we're not the only office who thought about that. <laughs> Next slide, please. So there are actually two different pieces of legislation out in the house and Senate right now, looking to bring offshore wind for revenue sharing, but it's going to amend GOMESA. The first one in the Senate is RISE. It is a uh, White House Kennedy bill. And then uh, just recently introduced in July from the House, it is a Scalise-Carter bill, it's BREEZE. Now, both these look to amend GOMESA to include offshore wind that they will have the same authorized uses as GOMESA. So really it is just coastal restoration projects, hurricane protection, coastal management. But the reason why GOMESA was created was to help offset some of those coastal impacts from those communities in the Gulf Coast. Now offshore wind is gonna have different impacts and there is more you could do with that money, which is the reason why our office introduced the Owner Act, which is offshore wind for Northeastern Virginia revenue. So looking at cultural protection, mitigation, resilience, all these great things that we all know and love and need. We're also looking into workforce training, infrastructure, STEM education, the things we need for the future to sustain offshore wind and clean energy development. So I'm actually really proud our office was able to use the Owner Act. I was instantly like involved in developing this bill. It's kind of my child. So I want to make sure we understand that in the house, we are looking towards the future of how we can maintain these funding streams 
to be able to have coastal resiliency and have dedication towards that, not just through appropriations, but through the go-making process. And I went really fast, so I want to make sure we have time for questions. Thanks, Spring. And with that, um, we are all available to take questions. Thank you all so much for presenting um, and pulling this all together so that we could uh, highlight force. And um, are there any questions out there? I think you can put them in the chat. I saw a chat that explained it. Hi, hi, this is Lisa uh, from the No Essential Library, and thank you all so much for these really informative presentations. Uh, mm -hmm. Just really quickly before we start our Q&A, I want to remind the audience that we're very interested in taking your questions for the next 10 minutes. So please type them in the questions chat box and I will read them to the group or to the individual you'd like to address your question to. Um, there were two questions that came in. Um, but while we wait for other questions as well, I want to remind you that there, the slides were shared with us. So if you go to the handouts uh, menu, you can download the slides. And more importantly, if you know somebody who would love to hear about the amazing work of these fellows, please share that we will be uploading the recording of this webinar to the YouTube channel for NOAA Central Library. And I've put that link in the chat. So let's go get started with these questions. Um, one moment. So this first question is uh, it's, it's pretty big. I'm not sure who it's directed to necessarily, but it says, please let me know if you were aware of a person or group studying the following. Restocking terrestrial waters to historic norms should be a global project with the intent to reduce, perhaps reverse, sea level rise and attendant losses. JPL work identifies one third of major groundwater ba basins, most crucial for quote, food security, uh, that are distressed. Um, this person actually included a link, but uh, anyone want to field that question or take it on collectively? Or is this something that you might want to address offline? Do you want to jump in, Rebecca? I saw your... Oh, no, I mean, unless you have a, a more substantial answer, mine was going to be that, uh, yeah, I would need some time to kind of think about and, and process exactly uh, what connections to to make to answer that question. Yeah, uh, definitely. Thank you for bringing that to our attention, though, and we'll um, consider it and get back to you. We do have a, a Knauss fellow email um, as well as then our individual emails to um, respond to questions that we're not able to get to today or want to take some more time to consider and respond to. Excellent. Uh, next question. Does the new standards of implementation for federal flood risk management have a schedule that requires flood uh, floodplain mapping occur, mapping occur more frequently? The current maps made by ACE are as much as 15 years out of date and represent a past that does not exist anymore due to rapid rate of sea level rise and also of the new deluge rainstorms that are occurring in many places. Uh, yeah, so that's a that's a great question. I'm not sure about um, exact timelines, but I do know that FEMA is investing about $55 million over the next few years to do a lot of updates to their flood maps. Um, so we'll, we will be incorporating those maps into that decision support tool that I talked about. Um, and in the for the first stage of the FFRMS decision support to roll out, uh, these maps will be focused mostly on coastal areas because, like I said, that's where most of the actionable science is. Um, but in the years to come, we, there will be also be more focus on creating those um, kind of uh, 500 or 1,000 year floodplain maps for inland areas as well. And I'll jump in on the um, precipitation frequency estimate side from these deluge rainstorms, as you called them. Um, one of the elements of that DOT work plan is, is also including um, and supporting Atlas 14 and 15, because um, similarly, that's the side that does the precipitation estimates and part of the bipartisan infrastructure law provisions as well. So there are NOAA's um, from what we've seen, covering everything from the decision support tools that do the floodplain mapping to the science, um, the sea level rise and precipitation elements as well. 
Um, so really covering that gamut of the uh, value chains to make sure that communities have all the data that they need to be resilient um, now and in the future. Thank you for the response, guys. Um, this next question asks, to what degree are you, slash Noah, working partnering with consulting firms that now are focusing on developing climate resilience portfolios, portfolios especially coastal? Yeah, that seems like a, can you, sorry, can you repeat that first part? partnering sure. with? Uh, yeah, so to what degree are you working or partnering with consulting firms that now are focusing on developing climate resilience portfolios, especially coastal? And I think that the assumption is that you is NOAA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Consulting firms. Eleanor, can you shed some light on that? Absolutely. Um, so I, I can't speak for NOAA at large, but the private industry, especially the climate enterprise, is definitely something that I've been thinking a lot about and I know that um, a lot of us have been thinking a lot about. And if you have, if you're interested in learning more about how small businesses and consulting companies can be, be involved, if you're on the research side, um, definitely reach out to the Technology Partnerships Office, which is TPO, they're within OAR. Um, they're a great resource for learning more about what opportunities there are and also success stories that exist. Um, but certainly supporting the climate enterprise and growing that enterprise. Um, I've heard everything from an estimate of a billion dollars to $12 billion in terms of what that could be to $100 billion, I think. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities in that area. And I think that NOAA is, from what I've seen, increasingly getting involved in supporting that on the climate side and coastal resilience side. Excellent. I just have, oh, I have something please. quick to add to that, which I don't know if this is fully addressing your question, but um, in the external research that we're funding, it's a lot of work uh, to couple uh, these coastal models so that they can be used um, by communities um, that may or may not be underserved to come up with more innovative designs. Uh, for their flood management. And I think that there is likely, the idea is to have those more innovative designs be more accessible. Um, and so I think that there will inevitably be some sort of private um, support or uh, collaboration that helps there, but or that happens there, but the idea is to uh, make it a little bit more accessible. Yeah, and that's something that I, I agree. Like, I don't know if it quite gets to the consulting, uh, like working with uh, consultants, but a lot of the interactions that I've had with private partners is working on um, cooperative agreements to um, engage with different private partners who are working maybe in machine learning and artificial intelligence areas and might be able to help us advance some of our capabilities uh, when it comes to flood modeling and maybe precipitation modeling, there's just a, such a vast array of tools and uh, private sector investments in uh, that are aligned with what NOAA is also interested in accomplishing. Wonderful. Uh, we do have one more la last question before we end our presentation, and it, it's a question directed at you as fellows. Are all of your fellowships based in DC? We can all answer that, uh, but yeah, we have fellows that are, a, a lot of us moved to DC this year, but uh, most of us, or not most of us, some of us are still working remotely, but I do believe that all of our positions are at least based in like Virginia, DC, Maryland, like the DMV area. Um, so all of us here, I think that are on this call, we've all moved to uh, DC. And there are still fellows, um, there are some fellowships that are not based in the DC area. There's at least one in Michigan, I believe. Um, so there's still some element, not all fellows are in the DC area, but for sure the majority are. Um, so it's been a great opportunity to learn more about the area in addition to learning about all of the scientific and policy aspects that we're working on. Excellent. Well, thank you. Interested. Oh, sorry. If anybody's interested in a fellow or potentially fellows in the future, uh, host office applications are due at the end of September. 
um, for uh, hosting a fellow in the future. And our cohort for 2023 has already been announced. Yeah, it's very exciting. I just saw that on the website. Excellent. Well, that will be our last question for today. And uh, again, thanks again for this really interesting presentation that Eleanor and Rebecca organized. And to all the force members who spoke today, I appreciate all your experience. Uh, Mariana, I, I appreciate that you hosted. And uh, for your presentation, if you didn't get a chance, uh, watch Mariana's presentation that took place in June. It is on the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel. And to everyone else, uh, thank you for joining us for a Canals Lunch and Learn webinar. Uh, we host them every third Thursday of the month at 12 p.m. So I hope we'll see you again. And everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.